Hello, my name is Obsidiman, and this is my comprehensive Interstellar Rifts tutorial, the series designed to teach the ins and outs of the game. This video is part two of the Ship Editor tutorial, looking at how to set up functional power and weapon groups, and how to share creations with friends and online. If you haven't already, be sure to watch the basic ship editor tutorial before this one, as it covers the different construction modes for designing a ship. This video will assume at least a basic familiarity with each of the construction modes. The most important requirement to make a functional ship is having sufficient power generation. If you press F4 or the group edit button in the bottom left panel, you'll enter group edit mode, where you can set up power, life support, and weapon groups for the ship. The leftmost panel shows a list of all the groups for the selected system. The arrow next to the group list panel will bring up the information about the selected group. The middle panel shows every device in the group, and the right panel has overall statistics for the group, and a box that will show information about any device selected from the group. To create a new group, press the plus button at the bottom of the panel. Enter a name for the new group and press enter. To remove a group, select it and press the minus button. When you make a new ship, it will automatically have one power group called Default Group, which contains every device which generates, stores, or uses power. To move a device from one group to another, select the group you want to move it to, then click on the device in the editor space. You can also move multiple devices by selecting them in the device list, then pressing the Move All Devices To button and choosing the destination group. A device can only be in one power group at a time. If a device isn't in a power group, you will see a warning symbol next to the device in the editor space. Devices must be in a power group in order to function. In the group statistics panel, four values are listed. The power capacity, measured in power units, shows the total amount of power that can be stored in the group. It can be increased primarily by adding batteries or power cells to the group. The power generation statistic is measured in power units per game tick, or 20th of a second. It shows how much power can be generated by all generation devices in the group. This includes hydrogen generators, solar panels, and also any power outputted by the batteries in the group. Drain is measured in power units per tick, and shows the total amount of power required by devices that have a continuous drain while operating, like shield generators, refineries, and engines. Note that the power required to sustain warp is not included in the drain value. The peak power value is measured in power units, and represents the highest amount of power that could be required in a single tick, from devices like teleporters, doors, or molecular assemblers. The peak power does not include the power required for a ship to activate warp or increase a warp level. You can see how a device will affect any of the four values in the device info panel. For most ships, the highest energy requirement to meet is the warp drive, power for which is drawn by the cockpit of the ship. There are two power draws that must be taken into account for a ship to warp. The first is the energy required to charge the warp drive, either when engaging warp or when increasing a warp level. This value is calculated by taking the ship's mass and multiplying it by 1.5. The cockpit will charge up to the required amount when engaging or increasing warp. If enough power is available, the charge time will be instant. Power cells are useful for achieving this, since they can discharge all of their stored power instantly. The second is the cost to sustain warp, the formula for which is ship mass divided by 45. This value is power needed per tick, so in order to keep your ship in warp, it needs to continuously output at least this much power. The rightmost value in the information bar at the top of the editor will show the minimum and maximum values for sustaining warp. To find out how much power will be realistically needed for a ship, first figure out the heaviest resource you plan to store aboard the ship. For example, a mining ship would want to be capable of warping with its cargo filled with ore. The heaviest ore in the game is tungsten ore, weighing 30 kilos per crate. With a large cargo container, this ship has a cargo capacity of 300 crates. So the maximum amount of weight in cargo we can expect to carry aboard the ship is 90,000 kilos. If we add that to the 51,000 dry mass of the ship, then divide by 45 as per the formula, 
we find that this ship will need about 3,135 power per tick to sustain warp with full cargo. To find out how much a crate of a certain resource weighs, open your grip with tab and open the encyclopedia. Search for a resource and you can see the weight of one crate's worth on the info panel on the left. If we check the current power generation of the ship, we can see it's about 120 power per tick short. To increase the generation, we could add more generators, solar panels, or batteries. By adding batteries, we'll also have the added bonus of additional energy storage capacity. A single small battery can output 300 power per tick, which is more than enough for the ship. Adding two batteries will give us redundancy in case one is damaged. Just remember that if you use batteries to warp a ship, you'll drop out of warp if the batteries run out of charge. The mass of the ship also affects the ship's maximum sub-warp speed and the ship's turning rate. If you plan to fill a ship with heavy cargo, be sure to add enough engines and maneuvering thrusters to move and turn at a reasonable speed. Remember that the orientation of engines and thrusters doesn't affect their functionality, meaning backward-facing engines will still increase the ship's max speed. Also remember that a turning rate of 1, seen by hovering over the turn rate meter at the top of the screen, is broadly considered to be a good turn rate. Power groups have a built-in priority system, which determines where power is drawn from first, and which systems are the first to receive power. For example, the power generated by solar panels will be used before the power generated by hydrogen generators, preventing hydrogen fuel from being wasted. Similarly, life support will receive power before things like refineries or weapons, meaning that if there isn't enough power available, essential systems will be powered first. Because of this, splitting a ship's power system into multiple groups generally makes a ship less efficient. If you have one main group and one separate group with solar panels and doors, the power generated by the panels while the doors aren't being activated is essentially wasted. By putting everything into one group, the excess power can be used by other systems in the ship. One use for power groups is to control automated devices. Automation will be covered fully in a future video, but for now know that the cartridges used to automate devices wear down with use. However, they don't decay while the device they are installed in has no power. By placing the device, for example the extractors on this ship, into a power group, we can use a power transfer box, or PTB, to control the flow of power into the group. Make sure the PTB is in the group with the extractors, and in-game you can use it to request power from the ship's main power group. While the PTB is moving power into the extractor group, the automation can turn on, and the ship is able to mine automatically. Then, when you want to shut off the extractors to conserve the cartridge, you can set the PTB to zero and cut power to the group. Much like power groups, life support groups can be added or removed by pressing the plus and minus buttons at the bottom of the panel. Life support groups show every life support machine and all fans installed on a ship. Life support is far simpler than power, since the only requirements to have it function properly are to have at least one life support machine on the ship, and to have a vent in every room. Adding multiple life support machines will increase the total amount of oxygen that can be stored in the system as well as the amount of carbon that can accumulate before it must be cleared. Though it isn't listed in the life support groups, the thermal extractor also uses the vents to operate. For heating and cooling purposes, each vent can facilitate 64 cubic tiles of air in a room. Rooms larger than this may require more vents in order to be properly thermally regulated. Weapons and defenses aboard a ship are sorted using weapon groups, which function similarly to power and life support groups. As mentioned in the last video, combat-related devices require weapon CPU points in order to function, and ships have a base value of 125 CPU. The amount of CPU available can be increased by adding a CPU provider, but only one CPU provider can function per ship. If multiple are placed down, you will only get CPU points from the highest tier provider. The maximum total CPU a ship can have, using the tier 2 provider, is 500. A weapon group can be thought of as a list of devices which currently have access to the ship's available CPU points. Whichever weapon group is selected gets to use the CPU points, and switching to a different group will let that group use the CPU points. Because of this, any devices which you want to have active at all times, like armor and shield generators, should be in every weapon group, so they always have CPU. Then, divide the ship's weapons how you see fit, 
and put them into corresponding groups. For most weapons to function, they need to have an ammunition loader in the weapon group with them. This ship has both laser-based and projectile-based weapons, so there's one loader for laser cells and one loader for projectile ammo. Each loader should be placed in its corresponding group, and any ammo loaded into it will be able to be used by the weapons in the group. You can switch between weapon groups by using the number keys while in the cockpit, or by selecting a group from the weapon CPU provider screen. You can switch to device edit mode by pressing F6, or the device edit button in the bottom left panel. While in device edit mode, you can select any of the devices on the ship and modify their settings. Every device can be set to be either on or off when the ship is constructed. You can also set the permissions for every device. The drop-down menu lets you select which permission you want to change, and the toggle buttons let you set which access level has that permission. The operate permission lets players use the device, usually by interacting with the device's screen. The manage permission gives players access to change the settings of the device. There are also some device-specific permissions that can be set. Cockpits have a self-destruct permission, which controls access to the ship's self-destruct button. Doors have a room renaming permission, which allows players to rename rooms by changing the text above the door. When you set a certain permission to an access level, only players with that access level will have that permission. You can then set access groups for a ship in-game by opening your grip and navigating to Ship Options, Ship Access. There are three default groups, Guest, Crew, and Fleet, which you can specify access levels for. You can also create new access groups, set access levels for them, and add or remove specific players to them. The owner of a ship will always have full access to every access level of the ship. In Device Edit mode, you can also set the text for signs from the Furniture category, which can be used to make your ship easier to navigate for other players. You can also use the signs to label certain devices. For example, labeling each ammo loader with the type of ammo that should be loaded into it. Or labeling a tank which you want to specifically use for fire extinguisher water. Using signs to label devices won't change any functionality, but it can be useful to remind your future self about how the ship is set up. You can set the color for the text of signs, and with some signs you can add arrows pointing in one of eight directions. You can also configure the output strength of shield generators, and toggle the individual inputs and outputs of batteries and power cells. For other devices which have configurable settings, like automatic cargo transfer relays, you can set them up in-game, then use the modify option on the ship construction terminal to save the ship with the devices configured. Then, if you build the ship again from the blueprint, the devices will already have their settings configured. This works for every device which has a configurable setting. The Modify button will also allow you to make changes to a ship after it's been built. You will be able to perform any kind of edits to the ship that you want. And the bar at the top will tell you what resources will be needed in order to apply the changes. You can also load a blueprint to modify a ship into or save the modifications to your ship as mentioned earlier. Pressing Confirm Modifications will apply the changes to the ship after a short countdown. In order for a modification to apply, no players can be on the ship. Cargo stored on the ship will also persist through a modification. If cargo pads are removed, the game will try to place the cargo from removed pads onto new pads where applicable. Ship blueprints can be uploaded to the Steam Workshop, either to share them with your friends and the community, or to keep them safe in cloud storage. To upload a ship, open the menu and press the Steam icon. You will be able to enter a name for your upload, as well as take a screenshot of the ship. You can set the visibility of the blueprint to be only visible to your Steam friends, only visible to you, or public for anyone to download. Add a suitable description for your blueprint, including whether the ship's cost and stats are listed, and an upload note, which shows up in the change logs for the blueprint. Adding tags will help other players find the ship on the workshop. Once everything is set up how you want it, press Upload, and after a few seconds you'll be taken to the page for your ship on the workshop. The workshop link for this ship will be in the video description. Ships can also be exported and saved locally. To do this, press the Save button in the menu, and choose Export Ship Files for sharing. 
Then choose the file path where you want to save your ship. The ship will be exported in the .shipz file format, which is specifically for interstellar rift ship files. Give the file a suitable name and press confirm. To import a .shipz file into the editor, press the load button and select import ship files. Navigate to the file path of the ship you want to import, then select it and press confirm. The blueprint will be loaded into the editor, and you can save the design to keep it in your blueprint list. With that, we've come to the end of this video. The next episode will be about combat, looking at the different types of ship-based weapons, and how to survive an encounter with hostile foes. If there are any topics you'd like to see covered in a future video, leave your suggestion in a comment below. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe to catch the rest of the series.